Hello and welcome. I'm Carol Fleck and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's ADHD experts presentation titled ADHD medication options and benefits for children. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Walt Karniski. Due to technical limitations, Dr. Karniski will not be on video, but will still be able to see his slides and hear his presentation. Dr. Karniski is a developmental pediatrician trained at Boston's Children's Hospital. He was director of the Division of Developmental Pedi Pediatrics at the University of South Florida in Tampa for 15 years and worked in private practice for 13 years, treating children with ADHD, autism, anxiety, learning disabilities, and other developmental difficulties. Dr. Karniski is the author of the new book, ADHD Medication, Does It Work and Is It Safe? In today's webinar, Dr. Karniski will answer the questions many of you have asked. Will my child benefit from ADHD medication? How can I find a medication that works? And what about possible side effects? Dr. Karniski will address these concerns and more with evidence-based research that will help you to understand the many options available for your child with ADHD. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking this poll question to our live audience. What is your biggest obstacle to starting or managing ADHD medication for your child? Please select your answers and comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. You'll see the poll results when you submit your response. And while you do that, I'll point out that live participants may submit questions anytime during the live event. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive about an hour after the live broadcast. A transcript of today's event will be made available in the coming week. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 438 to access the slides, the webinar replay, the certificate of attendance option, and the webinar transcript. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine. Our latest winter issue is full of great advice like how to know if you're enabling your child and the steps you can take to build their independence, how to communicate effectively with a teacher, and two experts investigate whether brain training is worth the cost. Subscribe today for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, the sponsor of this webinar is Inflow. Inflow is the number one app to help you manage your ADHD. Developed by leading clinicians, Inflow is a science-based self-help program based on the principles of cognitive behavioral therapy. Join Inflow today to better understand and manage your ADHD. Click the link on the screen to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Walt Karniski. Thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this discussion. Carol, thank you for that uh, wonderful in introduction. And I want to point out before we go any further that um, I've been using internet websites for gaining information about ADHD for years and the attitude well, website is, I, I believe, one of the best websites available for both parents and even clinicians uh, for finding information and current information about ADHD. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to, to talk to you today about uh, the medication options and uh, uh, different approaches to treating children with ADHD uh, with medication. Uh, to add to what Carol presented about my uh, past, I want to just mention one thing as well. In 1970, I was a sophomore at the University of Kansas, and at the beginning of one of our classes, Professor Hamilton read us an article from the Washington Post entitled, 
Omaha pupils given behavior drugs. And the article stated that five to 10% of all Omaha students were receiving drugs for ADHD. And I remember at that moment, my indignation. And at that moment, I vowed to switch to pre-med and swore that I would be the one to rid the world of this monstrous practice. Um, much later, however, I learned that the article was in error. Five to 10% of children in special education classes were receiving behavior drugs, not of all the students in the school district, which is not surprising given that ADHD is frequently present with learning disabilities, autism, and other developmental disabilities. Uh, the only reason I mention this is that th this incident spawned my career as a developmental pediatrician. And 40 years later, I can look back on a career in which I have treated approximately 5,000 children with ADHD using what the Washington Post called behavior drugs. So um, today, we're going to, uh, at, at, th at this point, we're, we're going to talk about two primary questions. First is, is medication effective for treating ADHD? And the second question is, why are there so many medications to treat ADHD? In the process of, ad of addressing those two questions, uh, we will deal with four other questions. How do children diagnosed with ADHD do as adults? How does medication treatment affect adult outcome? Are there any differences between the brains of children with ADHD and the brains of children without ADHD? And finally, what happens to the brain of an adult with ADHD who was treated with medication as a child? Uh, I need to point out at this point that I've had many parents come up to me after I've made a diagnosis and recommended treatment. And the parent, oftentimes the father, will say, Doc, I know that my child has ADHD, but I, uh, and I know that he probably would benefit from medication, but I worry about what's going to happen to him if he's on, had to be, have to be on this medication for 10 or 15 years. What does it do to the brain? And 15 or 20 years ago, I didn't have a good answer to that. Uh, today we do, and that's part of what we're going to be presenting today. Uh, in most presentations about ADHD, it is common practice to, at this point, at the beginning of a presentation, to talk about what it, it ADHD is, what the symptoms are, how to make the diagnosis. I'm going to forego that today because I'm going to assume that, it, it, that we're starting with a child who has been appropriately recognized as having D ADHD diagnosed and uh, 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 options explained to the parents. But, I, but there is one slide that I want to present to you that documents for me what ADHD is and what it does to children. Uh, about 15 years ago, a teacher in one of the uh, schools that I was working with, uh, Tampa Day School, uh, told me that a, a child had been in her classroom the day before, a 10-year-old child, and he had gotten frustrated. He told his teacher to shut up. Uh, she sent him to the principal's office. The principal called the parents. And the next day he walked into to class and he, without saying anything, he handed a letter to the teacher. Now the teacher had not asked him to write the letter. His parents had not asked him to write the letter. His, the principal had not asked him to write the letter. He did it completely on his own. And this is the letter that he wrote. I'm sorry, Mrs. Miller that I t told you to shut up. I really didn't mean it. The reason I talk so much is because everything I think in my head blurts out of my mouth. It's a bad habit. I'm not really that bad of a kid. When I try very hard, I can be the best kid in your class. Tomorrow I will behave and try not to talk as much. In looking at this letter, I think that you can see spelling errors, punctuation problems, capitalization issues, a lack of organization, but that's not the big thing that stands out about this letter. What really stands out is what ADHD is doing to this child's self-esteem. And many of the problems that we see in adults are due not only to the ADHD, but in some ways more so to the self-esteem problems that develop in children when children are trying to address their ADHD behaviors. So given that, let's talk about the medications that are used to treat ADHD. And when did we actually start 
treating this condition with medication? Well, we need to go back about 80 years to answer that question. Um, Dr. Charles Bradley was the medical director of the Emma Pendleton Bradley Home in Palm Fried, Connecticut. Uh, the Emma Bra Pendleton Bradley Home was the first and only home at that time in the United States, a residential facility for children with severe developmental difficulties. Uh, Dr. Bradley had a practice of performing a spinal tap on all children uh, admitted to the, to the program. Uh, it, it was, and I need to tell you that a spinal tap is not a pleasant process. It requires the insertion of a needle at the base of the spine, a withdrawal of fluids from the spine that coat the spine and also are commun in communication with the brain. And it was believed at the time that you could analyze that fluid and determine both the cause and the best treatment of developmental and neurological difficulties. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case with these children. And all that they were left with was a severe, tortuous headache that lasted a week or longer. So Dr. Bradley was looking for a cure for the headache, and he came across a medication that was being sold over the counter called Benzedrine. Uh, Benzedrine was being treated, used to treat head colds, uh, nasal congestion, and in some ways, uh, obesity and, and overweightness as well. Um, and he decided to try this medication on all the students in the home. Uh, he gave us a, a dose to each student, and the nursing staff reported something completely unexpected almost immediately. They told Dr. Bradley that some of these children were now following directions, a skill that they had not seen capable of before. The children themselves were aware of the benefits and called the medication their arithmetic pills. Bradley noticed that the improvements were seen on the first day after starting Benzedrine and stopped the day that medication was discontinued. And he wrote, after only one week of being on medication, he wrote, the most striking change in behavior occurred in the school activities of many of these patients. There appeared a definite drive to accomplish as much as possible. So uh, Bradley really was the first person that recognized that a medication could have an impact on uh, behavioral difficulties in, in children. Um, a, a few years later, Leandro Panazon uh, in 1944 was the chemist at pharma the pharmaceutical company Siba, and he was fascinated with the amphetamine molecule. I should have pointed out that benzodrine consists only of amphetamine and at the time was being sold over the counter. So he was fascinated with that molecule, and he couldn't help but think that there, were, there was more to amphetamine than just weight control and head colds. So he tinkered with the molecule and eventually produced a new but similar molecule that he called methylphenidate. Um, it was common practice at this time to, for researchers to use the new medication on either themselves or family members before trying it out on, on patients. Uh, his, uh, Leandro's wife, Marguerite, was an avid tennis player, and he felt that this new medication just might give her a little bit more energy, so he convinced her to try it. Uh, the effect was quick and dramatic. Both of them noticed a sudden improvement in her tennis game, and Leandro named this substance after his wife. His nickname for Marguerite was Rita, so he called this new chemical Ritalin. And from there, all of the medications that we're going to be talking about today were developed. So ADHD medications can be divided into two main groups. First, the stimulants, and second, the non-stimulants. The sti there are only two stimulants, and after 80 years, they're exactly the same medications that were used by Charles Bradley and Leandro Panason 80 years ago methylphenidate, and amphetamine. Uh, there are also multiple non-stimulants that have been approved for the treatment of ADHD. And currently there are five, clonidine, guanfacine, adamoxetine, which it, the brand name is Stratera that many of you may be more aware of, bupropion, and veloxazine. Uh, these non-stimulants are not nearly as effective as the stimulants, but they cause less side effects and actually treat some of the side effects that develop from methylphenidate and amphetamine, and as a result, can either be used in by themselves or in isolation, 
or in combination with the stimulants to reduce side effects. So let's address the, the main question, does ADHD medication work? And there's actually three different ways that we can answer this question. The first way is to look at some of the research studies that have been done on the core symptoms of ADHD. Now, core symptoms are those symptoms or behaviors that are necessary to make a diagnosis. So they, they represent behaviors such as short attention span, distractibility, uh, memory difficulties, organizational problems, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and so on. So what do the research studies tell us about what medications do to those behaviors or to those symptoms? Well, one way of looking at this is to look at the number of research papers published uh, over the years. Uh, this graph shows the year on the x-axis from 1960 up to um, 2020. And on the y-axis are the number of papers published and recorded in the National Library of Medicine. And you notice that the research just started in the 60s. And even then, there wasn't much research that was being done. And not until about the 1990s did we start to see an uptick in the amount of research. Most of the research was being done on methylphenidate and amphetamine, the two stimulants. And around 2000, we began to look at the non-stimulants as well. So most of our experience with the non-stimulants has only occurred in the last 15 or 20 years. So, but, but what you should notice from this graph that every year there are 350 to 400 papers, research papers published every year addressing the question of whether ADHD medication works or not. So the, how do we analyze that many research papers and how do we come to a simple conclusion about what all that research means? Well, there's two statistical ways we can do that. The first is by looking at a, a simple statistic called the effect size. The effect size is a number that ranges from zero to infinity. The higher the number is, the more effective an intervention is. The lower the number is, the less effective it is. And you notice that methylphenidate and amphetamine both have effect sizes that range from about 0.8 to 1.2, which are considered very significant and major effects of those medications. So in other words, the research has shown that these two medications address the symptoms that they were designed to, distress, to address. Um, the non-stimulants are also effective for treating ADHD, but you'll notice Stratera or Atomoxetine, which is the generic name, is moderately effective. And Clonidine and Guanfacine, which we know by the brand names of uh, Catapress, uh, Intuniv, uh, Capfe, and so on, these medications are mild to moderately effective. So we can see that these the research studies in combination have shown that medication is effective. All uh, five of these medications are effective. But there's a second way that we can examine the question of whether ADHD medication works using this data and the research, and that is through meta-analysis. A meta-analysis takes a large groups of studies, applies a very rigid criteria to those studies to meet the criteria for an excellent study and rejects the rest of them that do not meet that criteria. So for example, Cortez and his group in 2018 looked at thousands of studies on ADHD and, and decided to focus on 133 studies that represented more than 10,000 children and adolescents and over 8,000 adults. And what they found was that all of those studies that met this rigid criteria for an excellent study, all of the ADHD medications were effective including all methylphenidate medications, all amphetamine medications, and all non-stimulant medications. Methylphenidate medications had less side effects and were better tolerated than the amphetamine medications. And that will come into play when we talk about these medications in detail a little bit later. So basically, what the, what the statistics research is showing us is that ADHD medication has a dramatic impact on the core symptoms of ADHD. But there's another way that we can answer this question of whether ADHD medication works, and that is by looking at the long-term effects of ADHD on a person's life. And to ask the question, can the negative long-term effects of ADHD 
be reduced with medication? Um, well, first, we know that children with ADHD uh, receive lower grades than children without ADHD. They are more likely to be retained and eight times more likely to be expelled. Uh, they are more likely to have frequent disciplinary actions at school, and they're less likely to finish high school or college. However, children with ADHD who are treated with medication are much less likely to experience these educational difficulties. But when children grow up, they become adults and they are no longer in school. So we can't look at school grades or school performance as a measure of success in life. And generally, we look at things like job performance and finances and social relationships to determine whether a person has been successful in life. The next eight slides, I'm going to present the results of the research on the outcome in adults. But what I want to point out before I present these slides is this is going to be a little bit difficult for parents to watch because it points out all the negative things that can happen with ADHD. And yet, I want to point out that at the end, there's a very positive outcome. And to remember that all of these outcomes do not occur in every person. They just occur more frequently in a group of people who have ADHD compared to people without ADHD. So adults diagnosed with ADHD as children are three times more likely to have been unemployed compared to adults without ADHD. They change jobs more frequently. They are more likely to have poor job performance, quit a job impulsively, or to have been fired. And they earn a lower salary. One study showed a $10,000 difference between adult, adults with ADHD and without ADHD performing the same job. Um, it, it, ADHD affects personal finances as well. Adults diagnosed with ADHD are more financially dependent on family members. They have more difficulty paying bills and they have higher credit card debt. They're more likely to borrow money at higher interest rates. And adult, adults with ADHD have difficulty with social relationships as well. They have fewer friends. They have more difficult relationships with their parents, spouses, and children, and they move more frequently. They are twice as likely to be separated or divorced and more likely to have remarried. Um, adults with ADHD, or ADHD affects sexual behavior in adults as well. Uh, ADHD adults are more likely to have a child born outside of marriage. They're more likely to have sexual adjustment difficulties, and they are four times more likely to have contracted a sexually transmitted disease, although this risk is minimal in ADHD adults who were taking ADHD medication. Um, adults diagnosed with ADHD are twice as likely to have been arrested and 15 times more likely to have been incarcerated. Uh, they are three to five times more likely to have been convicted of a crime, although, again, there was a significant reduction in crime in ADHD adults who were taking medication. Uh, ADHD affects driving as well, and that's not surprising given that distractibility is one of the most common symptoms of ADHD. Uh, so adults who were diagnosed with ADHD were more likely to have had traffic violations, more likely to have had a suspended license. They were two to six times more likely to have been in a car accident. And when they did have an accident, the damage to the car was greater than in accidents that happened with non-ADHD adults. That would indicate a more serious accident. Um, in addition, ADHD affects uh, substance abuse in both children and adults. Children with ADHD are more likely to smoke and to begin smoking at younger ages. They're more likely to use alcohol at younger ages and more likely to abuse alcohol as adults. Uh, adults with ADHD are two to three times more likely to abuse drugs, but less likely to abuse drugs if they are taking medication for their ADHD. Now, I need, at this point, I need to point out that many people believe that stimulant medications are used, that, that are used to treat ADHD are addicting. Uh, and in fact, amphetamine, the medication that is in Adderall, Vyvanse, uh, and, and many other medications that we're going to talk about in just a moment, does contain the, the main ingredient of amphetamine, and amphetamine can be used in adults. But they are rarely abused in children because when children take these medications, they feel, well, 
normal. So as a result, it's hard to uh, abuse the drug and take it more frequently when the, the adolescents that I'm seeing are mo most often arguing with me to come off their medication because they don't need it anymore. So multiple research studies have indicated that when children and adults are treated with stimulant medication, they are less likely to abuse drugs in the future. Um, there's a third way we can address the question of whether ADHD medication works, and that is by looking at brain scans in children and adults with ADHD and to ask the question, how have they changed with ADHD medic or with the administration of ADHD medication? Well, research shows that if you compare the brain scans of children with ADHD versus children without ADHD, that there are three areas of the brain that are smaller in children with ADHD compared to children without ADHD. And those three areas of the brain are the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex sits behind the eyeballs and the forehead. Um, the frontostriatocerebellar projections, and these are long nerve fibers that link the prefrontal cortex with the cerebellum. And then finally, the caudate nucleus. And the caudate nucleus is a worm-like structure that sits in the middle of the brain. And all three of these areas of the brain have been found to be smaller in children who have ADHD. Well, you might ask yourself the question, what do those areas of the brain do? What are they responsible for? Well, the prefrontal cortex is primarily responsible for planning and organization. The frontostriatocerebellar cerebellar projections help us ignore distractions, attend to things, and remain focused. And the caudate nucleus is critical for learning and memory. I can't imagine three areas of the brain that would better delineate the symptoms of ADHD than those three areas. And those three areas are the areas of the brain that are most frequently found to be smaller in children with ADHD. Well, the next thing to look at is what happens when these children grow up to become adults. When these same children are studied as adults, there were two incredible findings. The first is that adults with ADHD diagnosed in childhood continue to have the smaller areas of the brain as they did as children, with one exception. And that is that adults who were treated with medication as children no longer had the smaller areas of the brain. Those areas were the same size now as in adults without ADHD. And these changes in brain size were almost always accompanied by positive behavioral changes as well. So I'm not going to sit here and today and tell you that ADHD cure, I mean, the medication cures ADHD. It doesn't, but it does have long-term uh, lasting effects on the brain. And as far as we can tell, those effects are positive because they are reversing that smaller size of those three areas of the brain. So we have now addressed the question of whether ADHD medication works. Approximately three to 400 studies are published every year which show that medications dramatically reduce the core symptoms of ADHD. And adults who are diagnosed with ADHD as children have a greater risk of experiencing difficulties in all major spheres of adult life. But adults who took medication as children had less difficulties in almost every domain listed. And finally, children with ADHD have three areas of the brain that are smaller than in children who do not have ADHD. And these differences persisted into adulthood. However, these areas of the brain are no longer smaller in size in adults who were treated with medication as children. So what does all this mean? To me, this means that medication works. So next, let's now address the question of why there are so many different medications for treating ADHD. Okay. First, let me ask you, uh, to take a few moments and write down or just think about the number of medications that you can name that have been approved for the treatment of ADHD. I suspect that most of you will mention Ritalin, uh, Vyvanse, Adderall, Concerta, maybe a few other medications. Those of you that have children who are on medication might know of a few others. And those clinicians that might be out there in the audience should know about a lot more of these medications. 
Uh, remember, the, the stimulant medications represented only two generic substances, methylphenidate and amphetamine. And yet, would you be surprised to learn that there are 46 medications approved by the FDA for the treatment of ADHD? I've listed here only the stimulant medications. There's 36 stimulant medications that have been approved for, for ADHD. And I suspect that all of you will not have heard of every one of these. I have to tell you that when I started writing the book um, that I uh, finished last year, uh, that I didn't know about a number of these medications either. Um, so how do we make any sense of all of these medications? Well, there's a number of reasons why there's so many different medications for treating ADHD. The first reason is that both methylphenidate and amphetamine are short-acting medications. They begin to take effect in 30 minutes, they peak in effect at about two hours, and they wear off at about three and a half to four hours. So what does that mean? What is happening to the child who is taking three doses of medication a day? Because if it lasts only four, four hours, then a dose has to be given at 7 in the morning. And by the way, the x-axis represents the time of day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And the y-axis represents the amount of medication that is getting into the brain. So you notice that a dose taken of a short-acting medication at 7 a.m. reaches its peak at around 9 and then is worn off by 11, the child has to remember to go to the nurse's office to say, take a second dose, or the nurse may have to remember to come and give it to them. But that time of day may change from one day to the next because of when lunch changes. And then that child has to go through that again and again. Uh, and this roller coaster effect produces a number of changes. So I want you to first, then in your mind, draw a horizontal line and this line represents the therapeutic effect line. It means that any amount of medication above that line is effective in the brain and performing the positive effects. But now draw a second horizontal line above that, and that represents the side effects that occur. So any amount of medication that occurs above that on the left side will produce side effects. Obviously, we would, we would like to have our children stay in this, what's called the therapeutic range, the dis distance between the therapeutic effect and the side effects. And in, if, you, if you're in this range, then you are getting benefits from the medication without the side effects. But you notice if you're on a short-acting stimulant, you go through multiple changes throughout the day. So to emphasize this even further, draw a vertical line every time a red line passes a black line, and you see something like this. What happens at every vertical line? Well, at each vertical line, there is a psychological state change. And by psychological state, we mean the kind of overriding way that the brain is functioning at any given moment. At any given moment, we may feel um, excited, happy, joyous, anxious, fearful. Uh, so we can feel a number of different things and the brain will act according to those differences at any given time. But you notice what happens in children with ADHD who are taking a short acting medication. They start off in a non-medicated zone. They then reach a, a zone where the medication is effective. Then it re reaches a higher level where it starts producing side effects. Then it goes back down into an effective range and then it wears off and is no longer effective before the second dose kicks in. And we do this a second time and a third time. And then parents come to me and they say, well, doc, that medication that you started me on definitely works. He's doing really well in school. His te teacher says he's focused and concentrating. But when he gets home from school at 3.30, he's just so damn irritable. And why does that occur? Because of this shift in psychological state changes from moment to moment because of the short acting medications. If instead medication did this, what the purple line does, if it rose rapidly, entered the therapeutic range, stayed there at a steady level throughout the day and then wore off, then we would seem to have the ideal medication. So the drug companies have responded to our requests, our pleading, our begging with them to come up with long acting preparations. Um, here we have the short-acting medications that are listed, Ritalin, Methylin, Focalin, 
Ritalin SR, Methylin ER, Metadate ER. Yet these medications, although they are different brand names, they all are short-acting medications and they are all methylphenidate. Same thing with the amphetamines. There's four different medication amphetamines that are short-acting. They are all the same medication. These medications are still the exact same medications that Bradley and Patazon dealt with in the 1930s and the 1940s. But after pleading with the drug companies, they came up with some long-acting preparations. So on the meta methylphenidate side, they came up with Ritalin LA that lasted seven to eight hours, Focalin XR, which lasted eight to nine hours, and then Concerta, which lasted 10 to 12 hours. All of these medications are long-acting preparations, but each one uses a different method for extending the lifespan of the medication. And even though they are all methylphenidate, they can be listed as brand, different brand names because they use a different method for achieving that result. So they are different medications, but the generic substance that acts on the brain is, is exactly the same medication that Bradley used 80 years ago. Same thing with the amphetamines. The amphetamines started out with four short-acting medications. Uh, then the drug companies started adding dexedrine spantials that lasted seven to eight hours, Adderall XR, which lasted eight to nine hours, and then Vyvanse, which is probably one of the most popular medications prescribed today that lasts 10 to 12 hours. But remember, all of these medications are still amphetamine as well. So even though we now have 22 medications on this slide, they still represent the two generic substances that represent the, the stimulant medications. Um, so the drug companies did something else that increased the number of medications. And that is they used different delivery systems. And by delivery systems, I mean the way that the medication gets into the body. Most tablets, when you swallow a tablet, it gets absorbed by the stomach, gets into the bloodstream, and then goes to the brain. But these different methods uh, will address, for instance, children who are not able to swallow the uh, medications. And as time went on, physicians began diagnosing children with ADHD at younger and younger ages. So that now it's not uncommon to diagnose a child with ADHD at five or six or seven years of age. And occasionally, we even go down to four or three years of age to make the diagnosis. Uh, it's somewhat difficult to make the diagnosis or almost impossible to make that diagnosis before three. Uh, but what you notice is that a three or four or five or six-year-old child will, will have trouble swallowing a tablet and if we go back to that slide, remember most of these long or all of these long acting preparations are capsules. So the drug companies have now come up with different delivery systems that allow children who are younger to take the medication. So there are chewable tablets, orally dissolving tablets, liquid preparations, and skin patch. And by the way, the liquid preparation does more than just deliver medication. It allows, it's, it's one of the best medications to use for adjusting the dose. So you can adjust the dose by one milliliter differences, which is an eyedropper, which consists of one fifth of a teaspoon. You can just start the child on a low dose of medication, gradually increase the dose till you see the benefits, until you see side effects and then drop the dose back. So all of these preparations are different methods for getting the medication into the body of the, uh, of the, the patient. So we notice then that here are the liquid preparations. There's actually six different liquid preparations. Some of these liquid preparations are long acting, such as Quillivant ER liquid, which lasts 10 to 12 hours, and methylene li liquid, which are both methylphenidate medications, but methylene only lasts three to four hours. The same thing with the amphetamine medication. Dexedrine, Zenzetti, Procentra are all short acting medications, were at Zenith and Dynavel are long-acting medications and also come in a liquid preparation. Um, you can add the chewable tablets, and they also note that they come in short-acting and long-acting as well, methylene, quillichu, and Vyvanse. And then finally, the skin patch as well in the orally dissolving tablets. So this rounds out our, our group of medications, the 36 medications that are used stimulant medications that are used to treat ADHD. Um, 
and makes more sense of the uh, of of that process than this. So what we're really dealing with now is that ADHD medications come in two major forms, stimulants and non-stimulants. The stimulants are the most effective treatments for ADHD. The non-stimulants are effective, but not nearly as effective as the stimulants, but have less side effects. The two stimulants that we, uh, we still recognize are methylphenidate and amphetamine. The non-stimulants are the five st non-stimulants. And the stimulants are available in six or seven different uh, delivery mechanisms, tablets, capsules, liquids, orally dissolving tablets, chewable pe uh, pills, and skin patches. Given all of these choices and, and knowing what each of the differences in these medications give will allow you as a parent and clinicians to come up with a much be more better uh, solution, a more tailored solution for your child. And in order to make that process e easier, I've also um, developed a, an ADHD medication lookup table that you can see on my website, ADHDmedicationbook.com. And it, it, it has all the characteristics of the ADHD medications on the left and all the medications on the right. So if you click on methylphenidate, it will list only the methylphenidate medications and not the amphetamine medications. If you then quit, click on long acting, go down a little bit further and click on long acting, it'll list only the long acting methylphenidate medications. And if you click on liquid, it'll list only the single long acting methylphenidate liquid preparation that is available, Quilavant ER or XR. Um, so this medication lookup table may be helpful uh, for people that want to get an idea of what options are available. Furthermore, I would ask you that if you look at the at this lookup table, be sure to look at it with an understanding of what medications your insurance company covers, because this will allow you to find a medication that not only seems ideal for your child, but is also covered by your insurance. So how do we start ADHD medication treatment? Well, each clinician has their own way of developing uh, a starting medication. Uh, the, the, what I'm using, I, I believe, is a pretty common way of approaching this, but not everybody will approach it the same way. The first thing is that I will start with a methylphenidate medication. And the reason for that is, remember the meta-analysis study that we showed that indicated that most studies showed that methylphenidate was more easily tolerated and, and equally effective to the amphetamine. So I would start with a methylphenidate medication and always start with a long-acting preparation, never a short-acting preparation. Uh, I may use a short-acting preparation in the morning to help get things started, or I may use it at the end of the day to help extend the dose of the medication into the evening to help children go to soccer practice or do homework or get tutoring. But in the process, I al almost always start with a long-acting methylphenidate medication. Then I start with a low dose and adjust the dose to achieve the optimum benefit with minimal or no side effects. And at this point, I want to caution you. It is very common for physicians to start with a low dose. And that makes sense. You want to mi minimize the side effects. But when the parents see a positive effect, they tend to stop at that point and say, okay, let's stop here and not give them any more medication. And I would encourage you it, it, unless you're seeing a, a really dramatic change with that first low dose, do at least experiment with a higher dose to uh, determine whether you might, you might actually see two or three times greater benefit by increasing the dose only mi minimally. If, if side effects occur, then you reduce the dose back to the previous dose that didn't cause side effects. Um, I would also consider adding a short-acting medication as dose wears off. And I would consider a liquid or a skin patch to fine tune the dose. And finally, if methylphenidate is ineffective, even at higher doses, or if significant side effects occur, I then would consider switching to amphetamine. And if significant side effects continued, I would consider adding a non stimulant or treating the child with a non stimulant without a stimulant if the side effects were significant enough. So, what have we learned today? ADHD has a major adverse impact on child and adult life functioning. 
these adverse impacts can be minimized or eliminated with medication treatment. Uh, ADHD brain areas critical to focusing, paying attention, and learning are smaller in children with ADHD, but these underdeveloped areas persist into adulthood, and these underdeveloped areas become standard size in adults treated with medication as children. Uh, there are only two stimulant medications that are effective for the treatment of ADHD, methylphenidate and amphetamine, but they are available in multiple forms with multiple therapeutic durations using multiple delivery systems, which improve compliance and accurate dosing. Awareness of both these options uh, and benefits result in more effective treatment with less side effects. So at this point, I'm going to stop and say thank you for listening, and I uh, can't wait to hear your comments or questions. Okay, thank you so much. That was so informative. Um, before we start the Q&A, I'd like to thank Inflow once more for sponsoring this webinar. I'd also like to share the final results from today's poll. And the question was, what is the biggest obstacle to starting or managing ADHD medication for your child? Here's what you said. 43% said side effects. 13% said little or no improvements in symptoms. 10% said stigma around medication use. 10% said medication rebound when it wears off. 7% said resistance from a child. And about 5% each said taking medication consistently and refilling a prescription. Now to your questions. Um, so we had lots of great questions, Dr. Karniski, as you might imagine. Um, so our first one is when a child has ADHD and another diagnosis, such as autism, anxiety, or OCD, will ADHD medication treat the other diagnoses as well? And which should we treat first? That's an excellent question. And I have to tell you that I devote an entire chapter in the book to what are called comorbid behaviors. And what that means is that about 40 to 50 percent of children with ADHD uh, will have a comorbid condition. And that means that it accompanies the ADHD. It, they do not have the same, they may have some of the same symptoms, but they are not the same disorder. They are recognized as two different disorders. The most common comorbid symptoms are anxiety disorders, uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors, oppositional and defiant disorder. Uh, and uh, anxiety as well. And we see that 40 to 50% of children with ADHD will have that comorbid behavior. Now, directly to your question about whether uh, what medication, the interesting thing is the stimulant medications are helpful for treating all of the ADHD symptoms, but they have a tendency, they don't do this all the time, but they have a tendency to worsen the comorbid behaviors. So sometimes we'll start with a child who has ADHD and has a few temper tantrums. And uh, after starting medication, the ADHD symptoms will get better, but the attention span problem, I mean, the uh, uh, temper tantrums will get worse. Uh, and, and, and that is due to the, the, the chemical effect of these medications on the brain. And they do tend to make the comorbid symptoms worse. Now, the interesting thing is some of the, the most commonly used medications to treat those uh, comorbid symptoms are medications like Zoloft, Prozac, uh, uh, Celexa, and many other uh, that are medications that are used to treat depression, obsessive compulsive behavior, anxiety, and other disorders. And what we find is that when those medications are used to treat the comorbid symptoms, they make the ADHD symptoms worse. So what, have, what I've seen frequently is we'll start a child on, on a stimulant medication to help his ADHD behaviors. The ADHD behaviors improve, but he begins have, having more irritability or more temper tantrums. So we'll add an, a second medication to treat the temper tantrums and the irritability, and they'll get better with that new medication, but the ADHD behaviors will get worse. So then we increase the dose of the ADHD medication 
And we find ourselves getting into a circular box here in which we simply keep increasing the dose of medication until we um, have a child who's overdosed on both medications. So at that point, the treatment is to use one of those five non-stimulant medications because they treat ADHD and although they are not as effective as the stimulants, they do treat the symptoms as well as treating many, most or all of the symptoms that are comorbid as well. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it's quite a challenge. Um, uh, quite a few parents have said they see um, great benefits of stimulant medication for their child in school, but when the child gets home um, and the medication wears off, um, it's very difficult for the parents to get their child to do homework and um, that the children are not agreeable. Um, what can you say about that um, for in the evenings, um, after school and in the evenings to try and get better behavior from children? Well, the first thing I can say about that is that it's a very common problem. Uh, remember these, that these medications do not cure ADHD. Uh, they only treat the symptoms while the medication is effective. And what, the, what I know that those, some of those graphs were difficult to watch, but what they pointed out was when medication wears off, the medication just stops being effective. And paying attention to where that child is in relationship to how long a medication lasts and how long he's been on that medication will help parents and clinicians determine the right medication to use. Remember, some of those medications, long-acting medications, only last uh, nine to 10 hours. Well, if you took a dose of medication at seven, it's going to be well worn off by 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the evening. And, and if you're doing homework after dinner and say at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the evening, if you're an older a child, or, or even at midnight if you're an adolescent, then you're, you're going to be attempting the, the homework without medication. And that's the point when I would give a short-acting medication, usually right after dinner, uh, so that it lasts about three and a half to four hours and wears off before bedtime. You may see some increased sleeping difficulties if you do that, but generally you can find a small dose, usually only half of a five milligram tablet, that'll help extend the long acting pill throughout the day. The only thing you have to make sure of is that you use, a, if you're using a short acting pill in the evening, that you use the same short-acting pill of what you used in the morning. So if you used a methylphenidate in the morning, use a methylphenidate in the evening, and the same with amphetamine in the morning versus amphetamine in the evening. That sounds like a great alternative to try. Um, quite a few parents have asked, will my child have to take medication for the rest of their lives, or are they likely to no longer need medication as an adult? Okay. First place, uh, the bad news is that uh, ADHD does not go away. Uh, the good news is that I have seen some incredibly successful people with ADHD. And what they are able to do is use their ADD as a channel for success. Um, for instance, do you think Robin Williams had ADHD? Well, people actually say that he might have had bipolar disorder as well, but most people say they had ADHD, and he channeled that into uh, uh, being a brilliant actor. Uh, if you have a, if you marry somebody who remembers to pay the bills on time, if you uh, have an assistant at work who reminds you where you need to be for an appointment at any given time, a person with ADHD can excel because they're usually outgoing people and uh, uh, very uh, communicative as well. So um, the, the answer to your question is uh, that, that ADHD medication, first place, ADHD does not go away. ADHD medication works whether you're, you are five years of age or 50 years of age. And I think each person has to decide for themselves at what point they can come off the medication. I would generally say if I had ADHD, I would continue it for the rest of my life. Uh, because I want the benefits of those medications. 
And although we didn't spend much time talking about side effects, there are no serious long-lasting side effects from these medications. All of the medications that produce side effects, the side effects will stop as soon, within days after the medication stopping as well. What do you think about giving children medication vacations, such as on the weekends or during school holidays or over winter break? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, that is my one of my biggest bug, bugaboos. Um, medication vacations are the biggest no-no that I can think of, um, especially if you're dealing with adolescents. And most of the time, uh, adolescents won't want to take their medication on the weekends. And yet, what are they going to be doing on the weekends? They're going to be driving to meet their friends. And drive. we saw what happens when adults with ADHD don't take their medication, they're more likely to get into accidents and more likely to have serious accidents. Uh, in addition, I might ask you the question, uh, if, if you want to take a medication vacation on the weekend, and many physicians might say, you don't have to give it on the weekend, just start it on Monday morning. Remember that the, the way that the brain gets adjusted to side effects is by being on a medication for a while and gradually adjusting the metabolism in the brain to adjust for that side effect. So many side effects, such as low, slow appetite or difficulty falling asleep, will get better after a child's been on that medication for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. And yet, if you stop medication every weekend, he never stays on medication because Monday morning is starting all over again, and the brain is starting to get adjusted again. So we actually find that there are less side effects if you continue medication seven days a week, 364 days a year, the only day that I would allow children to not take their medication is Thanksgiving because of the appetite problems. Hmm. Is there an age that is best for a child to start medication? One mom says she believes her five-year-old needs medication, but her pediatrician is hesitant to prescribe it. Oh, excellent question. And uh, the answer to the question is you start medication as soon as you can demonstrate that ADHD is interfering with the child's function in life. And what is the child's function in life? It's to learn uh, in school, to learn not only when the Constitution or Declaration of Independence was signed, but to also learn how to get along with other children. Um, the, the, the biggest problem we see in children who have ADHD who do not take medication as younger children is that they continue to have difficulties with social relationships. And I would go back to that letter that was written by that 10-year-old. Uh, do you want to allow your child to develop a poor self-esteem uh, by, by avoiding medication? And I think that's what happens the longer a child goes with ADHD who's not being treated, the greater the impact on his, his or her self-esteem is, and the impact is generally negative. Um, quite a few people have written about the shortage of Adderall and how difficult it is to access. Um, are there um, suggestions for alternatives that may be available? Well, remember in the in the presentation that, that, that there were about 15 different preparations of amphetamine, and only one of them is Adderall, or two of them is Adderall, a regular Adderall and Adderall XR. Uh, and all of the other medications that are in the amphetamine group have exactly the same medication in it as does Adderall. So all you have to do is look through that list, find a medication that is, uh, that, that is an amphetamine, but not Adderall, and have your physician prescribe that medication. It may take a little bit of time to adjust the dose because sometimes the doses change from one medication to the next, but the effect of all of those amphetamine medications should be exactly the same as long as you're prescribing an amphetamine medication instead of Adderall. And so I would recommend things like Vyvanse and Dexedrine. Dexedrine, uh, and, and Zenzetti are sold over the uh, 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 sold for a fraction of the cost of these other medications. Um, I've seen Vyvanse sell for three hundred dollars, and uh, the short-acting medication selling for ten dollars a month. 
And so you really have to pay attention to what your insurance company is recommending for medication treatment uh, for your child as well. Not let the insurance company dictate what you're going to be on, but choose the medication that is both covered by the insurance company, but ideal for your child. Okay, well, thank you so much for this enlightening presentation. Um, unfortunately, that has to be our last question because we're out of time. But thank you for joining us today and for contributing your expertise to our ADHD community. Next week, yeah. our free webinar titled New Year, New Strategies, Helping Students with ADHD Plan, Persist, and Achieve Their Goals with Ann Dolan. We hope you can join us. Make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Thank you all so much and have a great day. And, and thank you for me as well. Uh, I, I appreciate everybody listening and I uh, wish you the best. Thank you.